Welcome back to Sprager Homestead. I'm Nikki and today we're going to be talking about the seven biggest mistakes new rabbit owners make and the things that you can do to avoid these pitfalls. So this list is kind of coming from the large amount of YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and email comments, questions, and other things that I get as, as well as stuff that I've seen in some of my rabbit groups. In the last 60 days alone, I have probably talked to a good 50 people uh, that have had these kind of problems and needed help. So some of this is coming from that. Uh, and just, just stuff that we see recurring over and over and over again. It seems like a lot of the questions that I get come down to basically these seven things. So the number one question that I get over and over again or, or thing that I see is wrong housing made of the wrong materials. So I get stuff about rabbits that have sore hawks or rabbits that have escaped their pins or accidental breedings because of a hutch with a divider that wasn't secure or, you know, an injury that happened because maybe the rabbits are being housed in dog crates, that sort of thing. So the big thing is you need to really do your research and put some money into putting good housing together. I, I'm all for trying to repurpose stuff. You'll see me repurpose stuff around here all the time. But having the right material is absolutely critical. One of the things I keep seeing, and this is the big thing that we're seeing a lot of sore hawks from, is people using hardware cloth for flooring in your rabbits. This is really not a good idea. The wiring is very thin and it cuts their feet. People think they're, they're doing something by getting the vinyl coated and then they can't understand why the rabbits are chewing all the vinyl coating off. Sometimes it's nails scratching it and then once it's loose they'll just chew it up. It'll also get moisture underneath that vinyl coating and just kind of rust out. So you can see it folds over. It's pretty thin. Uh, off the top of my head I'm not real sure what gauge it is. But what you really need to be using for floors is actual flooring grade wire. Uh, this is either 14 or 16 gauge. I'm not real sure, but it's much stiffer. It doesn't bend. Uh, so being that it's got bigger holes than the hardwood cloth, it's easier to keep clean because the manure comes out, hair falls through, excess hay, that kind of thing. But it also doesn't cut the rabbit's feet up as bad because the wires are a little bit thicker. So you want to be using the right materials. Uh, stay away from things like pressure treated lumber and that sort of thing. And make sure that your housing is sized appropriately. What might be okay for a, you know, a 12 pound silver fox doe might be fine in a 30 by 30 until she's got kits. So when you're housing for your does, you need to be thinking about how many kits she's going to have and how big they're going to be at that time uh, when you go to wean them. And make sure mom's got enough space. For your bucks, you need to make sure that not only they have enough room, but they need to have enough room to be able to breathe the does that you're putting in there. So for Americans, a lot of times, I have seen several people holding them in 24 by 24 cages. I think that's too small. But on top of that, your does don't have enough room to stretch, so your breedings are going to be very, very difficult. So make sure that you're sizing your cages right. You don't want anything too deep where you can't reach in there. You don't want anything that's real difficult to clean. And you've got to make sure that it's nice and secure. You don't want to be chasing rabbits through the yard. And accidental breedings are no fun for anybody. Except maybe the buck. The next big thing that I get a lot is always going to come down to not researching your breed. And when I say that, I mean it's stuff like uh, you're having temperament problems. I get a lot of people who comment on our Facebook videos and say, your rabbits are so calm and I can't get mine to calm down. And what it usually comes down to is a breed that's just higher strung. Your, your New Zealands and your Californians and some of that that has been developed for meat purposes, these animals were developed for commercial applications, not for your five-year-old to go feed or your 10-year-old to help with, you, with nails. They aren't developed for any of that so they're they tend to not be very people friendly uh some of them tend to be really nervous animals so you really need to do your research and make sure that whatever you're choosing is going to be a rabbit that meets all of your needs we tend to get a little focused um as far as homesteaders on the production end of things and we forget that there are other important attributes like are they good mothers 
And are they going to be okay when, when my kid reaches in there? Or is she going to get bitten? And you don't want that. You, do, you don't want anybody getting hurt or bitten. You don't want the rabbits freaking out, having heart attacks out of fear, or any of that kind of stuff. So breed research is very important. Uh, with that, you need to be asking those questions. When you're asking that breeder about temperament, you need to be finding out what is the appropriate age at which to be breeding them. I'm still getting way too many comments from, and questions for people who are breeding their New Zealands as early as four months and cannot figure out why they aren't nesting or they've got a nest box and they're throwing babies on the wire or they're killing them or they have no milk. And it's because these animals really don't mature until nine months. And I know that there are some people that say, I've been breeding them at six months for three generations and it's fine. I'm not here to have that debate with you. What I'm telling you is when you're doing your research on the breed that you're choosing, make sure that you understand exactly when those animals should start breeding. Most good breeders will be able to tell you that information of they should be breeding when they hit maturity. And in most large breeds, it's going to be around nine months. But, you know, every line is different. Some lines aren't maturing until 12 months. Some does are ready at seven. So this is part of what goes into your research to make sure that you're asking those questions. Along with the whole breeding thing, and like I was saying, we're seeing babies on the wire again. Um, if it's not an age problem, it might be about cleaning nest boxes. <laughs> and this is my number three thing on my list of, of things that new rabbit owners don't seem to, to understand and don't do. You've got to clean your nest boxes between litters. I don't see this mentioned on very many uh videos or websites or even in chat groups but if you are using boxes and they're going from dough to dough some does will not nest in a box that they can smell another dough so you want to make sure that you're cleaning them out that that goes way beyond just scraping them out if you're using wood boxes you need to make sure you're disinfecting them so that you're not getting bacteria and that kind of stuff even if you are assigning a box to a particular doe, there's going to be a month to two months to three months, depending on how often you breed your does, where that box is sitting in storage, whether it's above the cage or whatever. And mice are the same way. You can get mice in these boxes and does will refuse to use them. Or you can get rodent urine in there and rodents are notorious for spreading disease. So cleaning them is so important. And we've not talked about it before that I can remember in any previous videos. So I am going to do a video coming up on how to clean your nest boxes. Because there is a different procedure for metal as opposed to the wood boxes. Um, but so important to make sure that you're getting those things clean and disinfected between your litters. So number four is something I'm pretty passionate about. If you've been on this channel for very long, you know that I talk a lot about feed and feeding them right. So I... I tell everybody refer back to the other videos about where we talk about what they need, but really 16 to 17% protein, three to three and a half percent fat and 20% fiber is pretty good for all of your breeding rabbits, male or female. Uh, they shouldn't eat a whole lot of variants in there. Um, but right now we're seeing a huge number of people rushing into pasture raising rabbits, colony raising rabbits, um, growing all their feed for the rabbits. And while some of that is fine, some of it I don't really endorse, but everybody has to do what's right for them, right? You, ha you have to make the decision for your animals. You really cannot do these things when you very first start out. Because what I'm getting is a lot of messages from people like, my Californians are not hitting five pounds until 14 weeks, okay? What is the problem? Well, I can't tell you that information because you didn't feed them a commercial feed at any length of time to have a baseline for me to be able to help you. So maybe your grass is not the best grass, or maybe you're not giving them enough pelleted feed to go with it, or maybe you just have a slow maturing line. But I don't know that, and you don't know that because you didn't do, well, in, every, in science, what they call a baseline experiment, right? So... When you're first learning how to deal with rabbits, when you're first learning how to raise them, I tell everybody six months to a year minimum, you need to be feeding nothing but a commercial ration. And I know everybody in homesteading is working towards sustainability and you want to grow stuff for your rabbits. 
Every time you do that, though, it changes the nutrition that they're bringing in from that feed. So what you really need to be doing is for that first year, you need to create your baseline. You need to understand how your, la your lines grow. Um, you need to understand at what age they're hitting maturity. And then when you start feeding some alternative stuff, maybe feeding more hay, doing fodder, whatever it is, now you can understand how that's impacting you. Um, if you're not getting fur quality, then maybe your fats are too low. If you're having a lot of uh, enteritis or GI stasis, maybe you're not getting enough fiber. If they're not growing fast enough, they may not be getting enough protein. But you've got to have that baseline understanding of under optimal feed for domestic rabbits, which is what commercial feed is, under optimal feeding conditions, how do they mature and then make adjustments based on what you want to do. And you do have to understand if you're going to feed an all-natural diet, a lot of times that they're going to grow more slowly. But you can kind of understand how to mitigate some of that and where you can maybe add in, you know, sunflower seeds here if you need this or more hay if you need that. But you've got to have that baseline understanding. And you can't get that from other people's herds. You've got to understand based on your rabbits how they do all of this stuff, if that makes sense. So number five is ignoring the signs of illness. We see this a lot where people will send me messages and uh, the rabbit's now grinding its teeth or the rabbit has died or whatever it is. And it's because, yeah, we saw diarrhea for a couple days and didn't think anything of it. Or maybe the rabbit wasn't eating the last couple days. Remember that these guys are prey animals. So they will try and hold symptoms back as long as possible to avoid detection. And so what that means is they may not be showing the snotty nose. They may not be necessarily, you know, sitting in the corner grinding their teeth until it's to the point where they're just really, really uncomfortable. So anytime you see discharge, swelling, blood, diarrhea, uh, even discharge out of the eye, not just the nose, but also the eye, you need to take it seriously each and every time. I've talked about before how not all sneezing is serious, but it needs to be investigated regardless. So if they're sneezing, you need to be taking them out, taking a full body check, seeing if we've got hay or fur or something stuck in their nose. Maybe conditions have changed and you've got a dusty bag of feed or dusty pine shavings. These are all good things to look at. But you need to be ready for the, what if it's not? What if it's pneumonia? Uh, you might have to go the route of antibiotics. If there's a lot of whites discharge, maybe it is pasteurella. Maybe this is an animal you need to remove from your breeding herd. Regardless, you need to take every sign of illness, infection, injury very, very seriously and not just kind of let it go. So number six is one that isn't just new owners, it's owners in general, and that is making excuses. And when I talk about making excuses, I'm not saying you're necessarily making excuses for yourself, but sometimes you're making excuses for your animals. Some does are not good mothers. They just aren't. I, I see this a lot where people say, well, the first time she was young and she put them on the wire. And then the second time, I don't think she liked the nest material. And then the next time, I don't know if she liked the new nest box. Well, if a doe has hit three and four litters and she's never raised any, chances are it's her. I mean, I'm not saying that people don't make mistakes and put animals in a really bad situation, but even the does that I've had that have absolutely refused to use a nest box will usually remove nest box material, pile it up in a corner, pull fur, and try and, try and put babies on the wire in a nest. Um, you know, every now and then you get one, a new, new doe, every once in a great while that will just flat botch it up. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. But if your doe consistently is doing these things, it's something to really consider to get out of, out of the gene pool and to call it out of your litter. Not saying you have to, to put her in the freezer. That doesn't have to happen. If she's sweet, make her a pet. That seems to be where we see this the most is either the rabbit is really, really sweet or uh, I paid a lot of money because that's what happened to me. It's, it's happened to me a couple of times where I got a, a really fantastic looking buck and he threw me 
absolute garbage. I had a lot of malocclusion issues in his kits. I had giants in his kits, meaning that the does had a lot of trouble passing them. And the ones that we did get, the type was terrible. They were just horrible creatures. <laughs> and I paid a lot of money for them, so I held on to them for way too long. Uh, I also had a buck come in here that had ear mites that turned out to be endemic. We fought it for two years, and eventually he actually got anemic and died from it. And we just couldn't stop it. I mean, it was the strangest thing I've ever seen. But it does happen, where, where some of them, just for whatever reason, become endemic with parasites. Goats will do the same thing with with pinworms and that kind of stuff. So, um, but you gotta you gotta stop making excuses for the, some of this. And and sometimes it's really hard to be objective, uh, but you do have to be realistic about it. If the doe is not a great mother, if she's trying to kill her kits by four weeks, she's probably not something you want to keep breeding. Like I said, make her a pet if you want send her down the road to somebody who does want to make her a pet or just call her. But you cannot continue to make excuses for stuff. Uh, it just doesn't work. And it, it's kind of, in the long run, it hurts your, your program and your enthusiasm for, for the breeding of rabbits. So number seven, I'm sure nobody's going to like, but here we go. <laughs> the number seven, and it really, overall, it's probably the number one thing that I see over and over again, probably even more than the housing. And that is following advice from people who really don't know. We have this on YouTube a lot, right? So there's a lot of people on YouTube that are raising rabbits right now that have been sharing how-to videos from the moment they brought the rabbits home. These are really not the people you want to be learning from. A lot of times these people are, re are researching or winging it. And when they're researching, they're sometimes coming across some really bad information and spreading it like the gospel. Now, there are some good channels out there for rabbits. You don't always have to take my advice for it. Uh, but really, if you're going to listen to anybody that's raising rabbits, they need to have been raising them at least three years, multiple generations, and if possible, multi-breeds. Um, because I see all kinds of wild stuff where people will have meat mutts and they'll try and tell people all about New Zealand's because their rabbit is an eighth New Zealand. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. I can't tell you all about Anatolians when my girls are only half Anatolians. So some of their behavior in, in my dogs, some of it's attributed to the Anatolian, but some of it's attributed to the Great Pyrenees, right? Rabbits are the same way. I don't have any crossbred rabbits right now, but when you do, you, you it's really hard to make that determination of what behaviors, what growth patterns, uh, that sort of thing is coming from which breed. So if you're looking for advice on a silver fox, you probably don't want to ask a Rex breeder, right? And you don't want to ask the guy who picked them up the same time that you picked up your rabbits. He's probably not the person to ask. But what we also see in this is people get one piece of bad information. They share it on a YouTube channel. The next guy who gets into it, watches this, starts his own YouTube channel and is now spreading that same information. It, it was bad information when the first guy had it. But now we've got two and three and four and five people spouting off that bad information. So the guy that comes along that is looking to get into it sees all these other people giving this bad information and assumes it must be correct. And so they don't go any further. So I would advise you to really be researching the people that you're contacting or watching for information and make sure that what they're saying is actually credible. I know there are people that have been doing things five and ten years that aren't, aren't doing things right. But more often than likely... More often than not, uh, the people that have been around for a while have seen some stuff and can give you some better advice. So that's it for my seven things that I see new rabbit owners, you know, m making mistake-wise over and over and over again. These are the big things that I get contacted about all the time. Uh, maybe you think I'm crazy. Maybe you see something that I don't. Um, you know, some of you are in Facebook groups or on other channels and maybe you're seeing other things that I, I don't see mistake-wise. So feel free to leave those down in the comments. 
If you need to get in touch with me, you can always reach me on Instagram, Facebook, or by email. You can also leave comments down at the bottom, and I do my very best to get in touch with everybody and respond, even if it takes me a couple days. So that is it for today from Sprager Homestead. I see the sun is going down, so I'm going to go do my chores. Happy homesteading, and we will see you next time.